Howdy, I'm Callum, also known as Northern Dice, and I'm going to be previewing Shards of Madness by Triple Ace Games, a card collecting resource management game for two to four players. Everything you see here is the prototype version that I was sent for Shards of Madness. All the player boards look different, but they all have the exact same components necessary to make them viable for the game. You've got numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 and 6 separated by some sort of line so you can easily see where your crystals go. The crystals themselves are just little coloured pieces of plastic. Lovely little aesthetic to them, but that is literally all they are. The cards are oversized tarots, but again, art is subject to change. I personally love the art, just from the outset as an instant stand-in. I'm a big fan of the Lovecraft, uh, the Lovecraftian theme and that sort of stuff, so it sits really well with me. This has been set up for three players and it is a completely fabricated game so don't read too much into it but it is set up for three players and you can tell because there are three player boards but there were also three decks of cards, one between each two players. So in example this player would have access to these two sets of cards and they'd be referred to as gates. This player would have access to these two and this player would have access to these two. You'll also notice that they've already got crystals on their boards. This is referred to as mana and crystals themselves like the ones down here that this player is holding or the ones over there that aren't on the board aren't referred to as mana. They are still yet to be converted. This in the center is known as the altar and that is where monsters will be summoned from and the only way to summon a monster is to pay its mana cost. Different cards do different things and there are three main types of cards in this game. You've got your monster cards, which have instant effects. You have got your elder gods, which have end game scoring effects. You have items as well, which have after player effects. So the moment you've bought an item, then the effect can go into play, not in that same turn. You'll also notice that there are these two cultists, and I didn't mention those as part of the monsters, and that's simply because they are monsters, but their effect is slightly different, and they are signified by that symbol instead. And a cultist is a very, very weak monster, still worth points at the end of the game but they are worthy of having because you can sacrifice, get rid of them out of your pool, and then change them over for three mana of any colour, which is important and very tactical plays, uh, and opens up some very tactical plays. So the aim of the game for Shards of Madness is to have six cards summoned to you. Now, they don't all have to be monsters, all have to be Elder Gods, or all have to be items, they can be a combination of, but the moment you have six, you're then in the final round. And the player who is given this at the start of the game is done so to signify that they are the final player. It has no other purpose. So if player two in a four player game ends the game, player three and player four will still be able to have their turns. The other way to end the game is to empty one of these portals. Now at the start of the game, all cards are shuffled, seven cards are put into the altar for public view, and all of the cards are then shuffled and distributed equally or as equally as possible between the other players. Players will only have access to the portals near them unless a card specifies otherwise. You'll also notice that this player has got one card tucked under their board. Now the reason for that is as the game progresses you are going to take these crystals off of these portals, swap them for some of your own and eventually a portal will be left with no crystals on it. That will mean that the portal has opened and that means also that the player can pick up two cards. They can look at those two cards have a look at the effects, decide which one's going to be the most beneficial. They can then choose to keep one under there, hidden from all of the players and only accessible to them. And the other one is sent to the altar for public view. Then the, uh, the portal is refilled with five crystals again. Drawn at random from the crystal bag. Like so. Put them into their pool. So on a player's turn, they have a few options. The first thing that they can do is gain crystals, and they can do that in a multitude of ways. They can either take one crystal from either portal, like so. They don't have to be any specific colours, they can be anything of their choosing. They can exchange crystals as well. So that if they were to exchange one green, they could swap it for any colour on any of the cards, but take all of that colour. So a good play for this player at this moment in time might be to put this green onto this one and pick up all three of those yellows. Alternatively, they could put the green onto there and pick up both purples. 
it'd make that portal a lot more appealing to that player, but it'd probably give this player the advantage they wanted with the purple uh, crystals. The other thing they can do is they could choose to put one crystal onto a portal and take one of every color that they have not placed. So if I were to put a green onto here, I could pick up one yellow and one red. Or onto here, pick up one purple and one blue. A much smarter player would be to put a red onto there and pick up a purple, a blue and a green. But again, circumstantial to the player. The other thing they can do is channel their mana. And the way they do so is by exchanging crystals and putting them on the board. Now, they can do this in one of two ways. Just for effect, let's say that this player has got this many crystals. There is a max of seven, by the way. You can only ever have seven crystals. Should you ever go over, you put the crystals back in the bag. So they can either use as many crystals as they want to exchange it for one colour and place it on the board. So they could use these six crystals to put one green on the six, and that would count as six mana. Or, as a much more sensible and crystal efficient way, when you exchange all of the same colour, you gain plus one mana of that. So let's say I was to exchange these three yellows, I would be allowed to put one of the crystals on for mana. And when you exchange crystals for mana, you always put the remaining crystals back into the bag, unless a card states otherwise, which, obviously, they could. You'll also need to know that you must always have at least two crystals in order to exchange mana. You can never just exchange one and put it onto the one. And there is a reason for that. Anytime mana is spent, it goes back around there. So let's say I purchase this card, which is worth three. This would go down to the two. It's not an instant spend and you don't get any change. You do get to return, uh, do get to keep your returns. But the only way to get a one mana is to have one more than what you spend. So an example here, I could use my four mana to buy this three crystal monster. When I do so, that would go onto the one. And I can never spend that crystal. But instead, that is now counted as one experience. And that means I will have a discount of one yellow crystal anytime I make a purchase. And that stacks with any other yellow crystals I might have. So I might eventually be able to purchase that Cultist of the Wind for just one yellow mana as opposed to the three that I am meant to. The final thing to note with this game is the actual cards and their effects and how they are played. So I've got a selection here, I'm just going to go through some, but I'll start with the most basic, which is Occultist. Now, Occultist will always cost you three of a respective mana, and they will always score you four points at the end of the game. With that, they are pretty worthless, but they are really powerful in the terms that you can sacrifice this to move one crystal from any seal to your dial as three mana. When it says seal, it means portal those card stacks of cards that you had available. What happens is you just take it from any seal in play at all, even if it's not adjacent to you, and stick it onto three mana, which might even allow you to then open up a portal, crack open some new cards, keep one for yourself and put one onto the altar. As far as monsters goes, you always know it's a monster because of the lightning bolt, and the effect is always instant, which again, I assume is a in, um, hinted at by the lightning bolt. They give you different amounts of points at the end in Sanity. They will cost a different range of crisp, uh, mana, but of Ken, that is completely dependent on what they are. And just as an example here, the Migo, exchange all your concealed cards with an equal number of cards on the altar. So if you've got two rubbish cards that you've managed to keep to one side, exchange them for two on the altar, which can be any two at all. And then we have the Elder Gods, always signified by this little Cthulhu statue. They will always be worth a lot more sanity. Uh, always worth a lot more sanity at the end of the game, but will always cost six mana, which is the maximum that you can have of any colour. So chances are it is going to spend all of your mana of any one type. And these are always end game bonuses. So ex ex has example with Yogstathoth. When scoring, each item you have scores plus two madness. And it's consistent across. It will always be a modifier for scoring. And then, of course, we have item cards, which, again, cost different based on their ability, always give you a different amount of sanity, madness, whatever we want to call it. But that effect happens after your turn. So you produce one additional mana when performing a mana action. So if you are to collect, uh, if you are to produce mana out of your crystals, you'll always get one extra one for having the other sign with you. 
and items are always signified by this symbol. Now, with the end game scoring, you will always score based on the sanity you have. So in example here, you would score 22. Then you will score based on the points on your board. So let's say that you had two and six, that would be an extra 12 points for the mana that you've got. And then you get bonuses for the end game scoring. And then at the end, whoever has the highest score is the winner. So how did we take to Shards of Madness? Well, we found it to be a really unique game with a lovely Lovecraftian theme and excellent mechanics. And of course, lovely not being the operative word for any Lovecraftian game, really. It's not difficult to learn, easy enough to pick up, and the basics were there, easy to grab. Building a card bank, however, that complemented other cards was something that came with time, which we thought was great because it meant there was a large learning curve as you played, and it was something that you could develop as you went on. The use of crystals over tokens meant that it was really easy to pick the tokens up, which seems like a really small thing, but for someone with massive hands and clumsy fingers, it made the game a lot easier to play. It also made the game a lot more aesthetically pleasing, and it actually built on the theme quite nicely. The rules were written in a really easy to understand way, there wasn't really a lot of scope to go wrong, and any time there was, an example was given making sure that we knew exactly what we were doing and we had something to refer to. We did like the fact that they used oversized cards as well, because it meant that, once again, those clumsy fingers could easily pick them up. But also, it meant that across the table, you could easily see what was on the altar available for everybody. And if someone had something in front of them that might be detrimental to you later on, you need to be aware of it, because it was quite easy to see at a distance. Although the concept is always the same every single time that you play it, the randomness of the draw of cards onto the altar, draw of cards to you, and the draw of crystals meant that every single game was unique, which again was something really, really wonderful because it meant that those veteran players amongst us who constantly went for the same tactic sometimes didn't have that option because the one card that was the crutch for it just never appeared. We also liked the fact that the great old ones weren't massive power cards in the middle of the game. They gave bonuses at the end of the game based on what you'd collected, and it almost meant that your gameplay style had to change accordingly. So if you picked up Hasta on the fly, it meant that all the cards that you were going to pick up after that needed to reflect his ability to best score with him. We also liked the fact that we had to do minor math problems in the middle of it, which is going to sound really geeky, but we thought it was a really nice addition to any game because it meant that you had to forward think. If there was a card for four purple crystals, you had to ensure that you had at least three purple crystals to convert to four mana to spend it, or more beneficially, five mana to then get the one experience later on. It almost made it so that you had to think way ahead in terms of numbers, which is something that you do in games generally anyway, but this made it really explicit, which we really enjoyed. So did we enjoy Shards of Madness? And the answer is 100% yes, we did. When you manage resources in any game, it can often feel quite draining, long-winded, and you almost feel like you're battling to keep hold of things. But in Shards of Madness, it felt like you were getting crystals so quickly and spending them so quickly that the resources were easy to grab and it didn't feel really like you were resource management. It more felt like that you were time managing and planning ahead and ensuring that you'd have something future on. You might have got zero crystals, zero mana, but be way ahead of everybody else on that basis that you've got certain cards or you've got a place set up ready to get cards that are going to help you along the way. We thought that it was great that the game was incredibly light and quick for the actual theme and concept and mechanics behind it. Two players, we can now play it in 20 minutes, and that's not because we rushed through it, we still get damn good scores. On top of that, at four players, we found it never lasted more than an hour. It didn't make it a filler game per se, but it made it a really lovely game to choose when we didn't want that super meaty game, but we also didn't want the really quick game either. Something perfectly sat in the middle worked really well for us, and by the time that four player game got going, we could probably finish that in 50 minutes, 40 minutes, and it's because when you know the rules, you're fine. If you're learning the rules, it's not like you're at a dead end. You've always got the cards to help, the rules are simple to grasp, it's just going to come with time and you'll still be in for a winner if you get the right setup. We really liked how diverse the card effects were. I personally love the fact that the monsters that you summon are the things that actually do all of the stuff for you. You get them and it's an instant effect because it doesn't mean you are going to look for the most madness point you're going to be constantly looking for whoever is going to do the most stuff with crystals, the most stuff with mana, sometimes even the most stuff against other players. And it isn't always situational. Sometimes it's completely based on an opportunity. You see that there is a star spawn available, an incredibly powerful card for not much madness, but it allows you to grab 
a whole set of crystals off of any gate and put them on that card to use later. In any sense, that's going to open up a gate and get you two cards. You're also going to get a ton of crystals. Downside to it, it's not an overly highly scoring card, which means that that's one of your six taken. It swings and roundabouts, but it means the cards have value no matter what, and you always have an opportunity to use them. And with the fact that some of the cards actually impacted other players, it made for a much more competitive game too. It had just the right amount of take that to make it a game that way you had to be aware of your opponents, but not so much that they are constantly on guard and being worried about what is going to happen around them. You focus on you, and every once in a while it's just a sly jab to the side, to the front, just to make sure they're still aware of you, just to nick something they've got. I really like the fact that the gates were respective of players, so an example of a three-player game, I'd only have access to two of those gates, with one of them never being touched by me unless it was card effect. With that, it meant that the game was going to last long enough because we're not all just battering one gate constantly because of the crystal laid on it. It also meant that if there was a gate that was running low and you had been messing about trying to get certain cards out and not managing it, someone could run the cards down to prevent you from doing it, making again for that excellent competitive play because you can't do anything to stop them. On their turn, they're going to keep taking those crystals, keep running that gate low, and as soon as it gets to zero, if you've not done what you needed to do, well, I'm afraid it's tough. And we like that there was a multitude of options for players in terms of how they summoned. In our first game, we only summoned from the altar. We got cards underneath our um, mana circles, but it wasn't something that we constantly referred to. We might have summoned one or two, but generally it was all from the altar. And that worked fine. We still scored really well. But then as time went on and we carried on playing, we started to learn what the cards did. We knew which ones to hide, which ones to prevent other players from getting. And eventually it got to a point where if we had a certain card, we wanted to try and summon it and we knew we couldn't, we might have just kept it underneath there, just to prevent other players from having it. It did also mean that there was that level of growth amongst how much players knew in how to play. They would then be able to choose what they wanted to keep in order to future future-proof their entire game plan, ensuring that they'd be able to do what they wanted to do, ensure they'd be able to summon what they wanted to summon, knowing full well that items, in example, are fantastic at allowing you to do extra effects after doing actions. Getting one of those out early is going to be massive. Hiding one of those the entire game could be detrimental to someone else's game plan. As you've no doubt guessed if you've watched any of my other reviews or read any of my other content, I'm a huge Mythos fan. But this is a game that we found even Mythos haters could play. My partner does not enjoy the Cthulhu Mythos, and she thoroughly enjoyed this game. Her words were, it's a game that you can appreciate due to its mechanics. And I found, when talking to other people about the game, they said it sounds like a fantastic game despite the theme. There's nothing wrong with the theme. The artwork is lovely. The aesthetics are fantastic. The actual presentation of it all just fits in, and you feel like it is the Cthulhu Mythos, like you are actually going to summon a great old one if you're all in cult robes just because of how everything's presented. But all that's forgiven because the gameplay itself is brilliant and it does work. And the last thing to mention is just how component light the game really is for the amount of content that you actually get. I mean, for 75 crystals and 55 cards, four player boards, you are getting a lot of replayability, a lot of gameplay, and it's something that has been on our table since we received the prototype copy. And it's not left, not because we're just constantly playing it to learn it, because we're constantly playing it because we really enjoy it. So who's the game for? Well, thematically, probably the ages of 13 plus. It is mythos, which means that it has got those horror elements. And as much as, as adults, we look at those images and think that's fantastically grotesque. It's wonderful. It's really reflective of the mythos stories. It might really scare some younger players. Mechanically, however, it is a game that, when explained well, could be accessed by anybody who knows that if you've got four crystals, you can convert it to five mana if they're the same colour, four mana of one of the colours, and then you can spend it. It's more about your ability to use maths as the crutch for the entire game. After that is when the tactics come in. And as long as though you can do the simple math, you could just get lucky. I wouldn't say it's not for younger players, but thematically, I'd probably avoid personally. Mythos fans are going to fall in love with this, no doubt. The aesthetics are just stunning. As I've mentioned, the entire presentation of the game just sits so well. And at a distance, it just looks gorgeous. Those crystals are just such a fantastic addition. Great choice.
But the main reason we'd recommend this to anyone is because of how easy it is to pick up and play. Mechanically, wonderful gameplay is the main point that you'll be going for. But if you cannot access the game, there's no point. This is one that as soon as, as long as someone has learnt it, everybody can access it. The only downside really is that theme and I hate saying it because I love the Mythos theme. I love the entire environment and setting. But I know full well that this game could be accessed by just about anybody with a level head and a bit of maths behind them. But it's that Mythos theme that's going to prevent people. I implore you, don't let that put you off. And if it does, take a second look. The final question, which has probably already been answered, is would we recommend it? The answer from all of us that have played it is, uh, yeah, yeah, we would. The Mythos theme, as I've said, isn't for everybody, but it's forgiven because of the fantastic mechanics and gameplay. There's no end of card combinations, no end of coincidental crystal combinations that come out that allow you to set up to do things that just enable the game to play itself in some respects as long as you're making the correct decisions, which is how any sort of card building, bank building, resource management game should play. It should be on a basis of you make the decision and things just fall into place because you've set them up to do so. It's not an engine builder by any measure, but some of the effects continue on after you've got the card, an example of great old ones, an example of items. Some effects are instant, like creatures, and they aren't, inst uh, they aren't going to roll on and constantly affect everything. So it's that instant impact of those that's going to make the biggest difference. And the fact that they do and they can and everything can just fall into place so beautifully makes this one of those games that we cannot get off our table. We thought Shards of Madness was a superb game with great table presence, a fantastically executed theme and some wonderful gameplay. We'd really, really recommend it for anybody with a tactical head or who's got a thirst for the mythos. Thank you ever so much for sticking around and listening to me. Catch you next time.